Hi, everybody. Um, under the provisions of the Marketing Act 1963, you can also listen to uh, astronomy every weekend with Grant Christie and myself on Radio Live uh, straight after lunchtime, midday on Saturdays. Today, though, um, your, your opportunity to ask questions as we go along. We really want to encourage that. Um, no such thing as a dumb question, I don't think. You'd agree, Grant? Absolutely. And um, it's all about the, the transit of Venus. Grant's got a PowerPoint presentation, and I'll let him get into it um, pretty much straight away. But I just want to know, first of all, um, uh, I, I suppose a, a bit about the demographic here of what, you know, what kind of level and detail. We all know what a transit is of Venus. Yeah. So I want to know why on earth it's so important. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's a good place to start. The uh, transits are when some small object goes in front of a bigger object to astronomers, so it's not just transits of Venus, it's any small object passing in front of uh, a bigger object, in this case, a small planet passing in front of a big star. So they, the, back in the, around about the, um, well, up, say, the 17th century, uh, Newton had uh, come up with his laws of gravity and based on Kepler's laws of the motion of the planets around the sun. Uh, we had a, a, a basically a map with no scale. So basically in, in the, at that time they only had a very rough idea how far away the sun was. They thought maybe 20 million kilometres. The modern value is about 150 million kilometres. So, you know, they were way off and really had no idea. They were just it was really the big question of its day. You had uh, today, you know, in our time, it's the Hubble constant and the rate of expansion of the universe. In the, the time of uh, Kepler, it was how far away is the sun. And just that just gives you a scale of everything. I mean, everything comes from that eventually. And you know, if you know the size of the Earth, you can then uh, try to use that as a, a measuring stick, if you like, to measure how far away the sun is. And that was a technical challenge at that time. So, it, Halley, uh, in around about the early 1700s, realised that uh, you could actually use transits of Venus to measure the distance to the sun. Uh, and he realised that if you're watching a transit of Venus across the face of the sun from different places on the Earth's surface, uh, you have a slightly different perspective of the event. And so, the position of Venus is moved very slightly against the backdrop of the sun. And that's what astronomers call parallax. It's just like if you put your finger out and you look through different eyes, you can work out how long your arm is. Okay, so eventually, that's uh, we've got. We can just put a ruler on our arm, but you can't put a ruler to the sun. So essentially, the the idea of using that parallax measure of the position of Venus during a transit uh, was uh, a way of measuring the distance to the sun. Now the, the problem with that is in the 19th and the 18th and century and that, those sort of earlier times was that astronomers didn't have any good ways of measuring the position of Venus silhouetted against the sun. So you'd think it was a simple problem, there's a big bright sun, there's a little black dot there, figure out where it is, but in fact the error in measuring the position of Venus uh, against the, the backdrop of the sun was uh, the errors were just too big for the technology at that time. But Halley realised there was another angle to this, that if you just wait and let Venus go across the face of the Sun and you make a precise timing of how long that event takes, that the time it takes, or so the cord it takes across the Sun, that, that, that time interval is a precise measure, or as precise as you could do at that time, of where Venus was relative to the centre of the Sun the, in an image. And so observers in different parts of the Earth would go there and observe a transit of Venus and get that time, lapse time, uh, that it takes the planet to cross the surface of the Sun, and bingo, you end up with a, uh, different observers getting different times because they have a different view of the event. And if you could time the, that interval to a second or two, which Halley believed you could, uh, then you would end up with a, a you know, a pretty accurate measurement to within half a percent, if you like, of the, uh, the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So it all looked great on paper. And of course, Halley died before he had enough, this could be tested in practice. And so it was the expeditions in the uh, 18th century of 
to uh, uh, 1761 and 1769, notably with Cook's expedition to Tahiti, that you uh, end up with a, uh, the first real attempts to try out this method of Halley. They were bedeviled, unfortunately, by observational problems. Um, it turned out that uh, Halley imagined that as the uh, Venus passed in front of the Sun, <coughs> and basically the situation we have right here, that astronomers are looking, you, you want a precise time. It takes about 15 minutes for the planet to cross the edge of the Sun. <coughs> Uh, so 15 minutes is a long length, that what you wanted to see was just when the tail edge of Venus just left contact with the limb of the sun, which he imagined you'd be able to see that and get that time, boom, to a second. And similarly on the other side, when Venus came off the other edge, this isn't shown here, but basically when the edge of Venus just touched the edge of the sun on the other side, and those points are known as the second and third contacts to astronomers. Anyway, so, so timing the lapse time between that point and that point gives, that was what Halley imagined, would give you a very precise knowledge of where Venus was relative to the center of the sun there. So, <coughs> well, that's fine and dandy, but then, of course, Cook ran into, when he tried to observe it in 1761, uh, uh, 1769 in Tahiti, uh, found that the blurry image that they were dealing with with the optics at the time and uh, you end up with the fact that Venus appears to stay stuck. There's an optical illusion called the black drop effect when you're looking through a telescope, uh, certainly of telescopes of that era. Is, uh, that, is that the same as when the sun sets and it goes goop into the... Uh, no, not really, but it is if you get a bright background, like a bit of that white screen, and you hold your fingers really close together, yeah. and you bring them together against a very bright background, your fingers appear to sort of want to join together even though you know that they're not actually touching. It's that sort of effect. It's nothing to do with Venus's atmosphere either, because you see the same thing happening with Mercury. So it's, a, it's basically an optical problem. Uh, it's not an illusion. It does, it does happen. But it certainly meant that instead of getting the time to one second, as Halley imagined, it was more like 30 seconds. And Cook was distraught that the three observing sites on Tahiti all came up with these discordant results, and he considered this whole mission a failure. Mm. Um, so, but, you know, he wasn't the only observer. There were observers all around the Earth and at those times, and uh, the mathematical problems were pretty severe as well, trying to deal with, and there was no theory of statistics as such at that time. So, you know, if you had a bunch of measurements, astronomers would just look through a table and instead of taking an average and a standard deviation the way we do today, they'd just pick out, well, I like that one. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, their own. So, you know, things were pretty basic. Yeah, so, and uh, you can't do it on a cloudy day. You can't do it on a cloudy day. Now, the other thing about the reason that Halley chose a sort of time interval it's, uh, from there to there is that clocks were very poor. And actually knowing your time absolutely, like Greenwich Mean Time, somewhere else on the planet apart from Greenwich was pretty near impossible at the time of Cook's expedition. So Halley, that's why he was using this interval of time to measure. But that meant you had to be somewhere on Earth where you could see the start and the finish of the event. Later on, by the 19th century, the clocks were better. They were regulated by telegraph, and so it was possible to get the time. You, you could be in a place like in Auckland in 1882, where we only saw the, the sun, Venus, coming off the edge of the sun. We didn't see the start of it. it was already, Venus was already on the sun when the sun rose in 1882 here in Auckland. So you didn't see that part, but you saw the end part. But you could time things, and, and time could be controlled through... Uh, wire, uh, through um, the um, electrical system using telegraph. Was there someone else further uh, east that was going to be able to see it the whole way? Yeah, well, the other, well that's the thing that, you know, because if you, if you only rely on parts of the Earth where you can see the start and the finish, that narrows your geographical range. If you allow, if, if you, you can time the event more precisely and allow for just seeing that side or that side, then suddenly the number of places you could observe the event from is expanded considerably. So telegraph and uh, wires uh, running under the ocean uh, were a big advance that uh, took place in the 19th century. So, so essentially that's, that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to measure the position of Venus and measure its precise position relative to the center of the sun, and they're just coming up with these ways of, of actually doing it. Okay. The, when you say Venus, as soon as it, the edge of Venus touches the edge of the sun, is 
is the edge of the sun, when it's observed like that, actually clear, or is there a grey, hazy region? It's pretty, it's pretty, it should be pretty sharp when you're looking through a filter that covers all the wavelengths. Okay. Um, you often see pictures in books showing the prominences on the edge of the sun and so on, which gives it the edge of the sun a fairy look, but that's only if you're looking in one precise wavelength called hydrogen alpha right. in the red part of the spectrum. So then you start to see the prominences displayed around the edge of the sun. But in Cook's instruments, the sun looked like a perfect circle. And in fact, uh, you know, the, the circularity of the sun is extraordinary. It's, it's, it's extremely hard to measure any deviation from it, even with modern instruments. So the sun is nearly close to a perfect sphere oh. uh, in the sky. So it is a, effectively is a circle. In the 19th century, uh, by 1882, they were starting to experiment with photography. The other way the Americans tried when they were here in 1882 was to photograph. And, and in 1874, incidentally, they tried to decide, well, why don't we just photograph the sun with a high-resolution camera? And then later on, after the event, we'll use a microscope and then make precise measurements of the position of Venus relative to the, the centre of the sun that way. It wasn't entirely successful, but it was a sort of a, a change of approach, if you like, to the timing method. If they ask a question any time you like, it's encouraged to... Yeah, sure, Mercury. Uh, so that's a good question. People say, well, we see transits of Mercury much more often, you know, sort of, I don't know, it's about 14 per century on average. Um, I've seen a number. But the trouble with using Mercury is, A, it's much closer to the Sun, so the parallactic effect is much smaller. It's bad enough with Venus, it's pretty near impossible with Mercury. And Mercury is such a small object as well, it's much smaller than the size of Venus silhouetted against the Sun. So all in all, it was never a useful... Uh, method of finding the, the uh, distance to the sun. Well, the fact that they used Venus to make the measurements of the sun against, is that because they had information about Venus? Did they know how big that was or how far away that was? No, that was still pretty uncertain. They, they knew the Kepler's laws and observations of the orbital periods of the planets gives you the order that they are away and the proportions. So we knew the, the, the ratio of the size of Mercury's orbit to Venus to Earth right out to Jupiter, because of course, and Saturn, but uh, that was the extent of it at Cook's time. We didn't know about Uranus and Neptune at that point. But the ratios were determined by Kepler's third law. So we knew the ratios. All you have to do is find the physical distance of one of those planets and you've got the size of the solar system. You don't need to measure them all individually at all. Well, you'd use it relative to the sun because uh, measuring uh, the position of Venus in the sky relative to stars is, would be very difficult. Um, however, they did try this using Mars. An alternative method that was available in the 18th and 19th century was to measure the position of Mars. When Mars is at opposition, it's its closest point to Earth, and it's silhouetted against the starry background. So using those stars as reference points, and you say, use a telescope, you can try to work out exactly where the meridian, that is the centre of Mars, is against a starry background. And if you do that from, say, Greenwich uh, and Cape Observatory, which is, you know, basically on the same line of longitude, then Mars should be slightly displaced because of your viewing position is slightly different. But Mars at its closest is about 55 million kilometres. So that was the other way, it was working out the parallax of Mars. However, in the, even in the 18th century, those methods were, um, and in the 19th century, were, were difficult to actually achieve. So measuring positions of something like a little blurry blob against a starry background is not a trivial undertaking. And, and so it, although it was tried, it wasn't brilliant. Um, that, uh, but you don't have to use a planet. You know, for example, the um, minor planet Eros was discovered in about 1890 something, uh, and it was a, a, a asteroid in a orbit that brought it actually quite close to the Earth. I think about 17 million kilometers, just from memory. But it comes a lot closer than Mars, and it has the advantage: it's a little small body, so it's a little star-like point on your images. So if you take a photograph of Eros against a starry background and measure it on the photographic plate with a microscope, you can work out the position of Eros very precisely. So by Eros came close to the 
uh, close to Earth in about, I think, 1900. So by 1900, they were able to, for the first time, get a, a believable fix on the astronomical unit that what they were looking for. So it wasn't until Eros was discovered that that solved the problem. It came close again, I think, in 18, 1933. So even by 1933, observations of Eros using the parallax method were still the best way of finding the distance to the Earth to the Sun. Hmm. Oh, what does Eros look like? Is it, you it's said a, it's a minor planet. Yeah, it's about the size of Waiheke Island, about 30 kilometres oh, okay. long, a sort of a potato-shaped object, and notable in that there's a, a spacecraft went to Eros, orbited Eros for about a year, imaged it, so we've got fantastic images of Eros, and then famously at the end of that they then brought it down, landed it softly on the surface. So right now Eros is still orbiting in the solar system now with a man-made object sitting on the surface, it'll be there for millions of years of course. So, so Eros was, uh, was really the breakthrough that solved the, essentially solved the problem. Um, of distance determination. There were other methods too, uh, but in the, uh, there was at least half a dozen you know, methods used to try to work out the astronomical unit uh, in the n active in the 19th century. The big problem was they didn't all produce the same result. It was very hard to work out which was the right value. Uh, but by the time of um, 1874, 1882 transits last century, uh, the errors of them all had come down. So they were, we were talking about errors of maybe 2 or 3%. So the transit is basically the first transit. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's historically what it's used for. Today, of course, it's a slightly different thing. I mean, we, we don't need to do that to work out that. We know the distance to the Earth to the Sun to within about 30 metres. So what is it? I don't want to rain on your transit, but um, what... what what is the big deal about a transit now? Oh, the, 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 the interest in transits scientifically now, uh, there's still a historical interest in them because, you know, it's nice to see something that kept in Cook's store. Hmm. Uh, but apart from that, the scientific interest now is that transits of planets in front of other stars are being used to, one, discover that there are planets orbiting other stars, and this is the Kepler Space Telescope uh, is notable in this area. It's uh, hoovering up thousands of new planet discoveries right now, several thousand it's got in total and will run up to probably 10,000 by the time its mission's over. Um, so that telescope simply is staring at 150,000 odd stars every, you know, every matter of say every 20 seconds it's imaging those and making a very precise measurement of the brightness of those stars and picking out all the ones where occasionally a planet will pass in front of them and their brightness will dip for a few hours and come up again. Uh, and uh, they've detected another planet, capable of detecting Earth-sized planets, in fact, over a period of about sort of six or seven years of observation. So Kepler's doing great stuff there. So Kepler's finding, using transits to find planets, in addition to that, once Kepler's identified that there's a planet orbiting a particular star in its field of view, that information gets passed to really large telescopes on Earth, uh, with mirrors much bigger than Kepler's, maybe eight meter class telescopes, where they can make very precise measurements of the spectrum of that star as the planet passes in front of it. And theoretically, in fact, practically as well uh, now, they, they, you can actually detect the atmospheres of some of these uh, planets as they pass in front of their parent star. So, in the case of the current transit, coming back to your question, is that the seeing a transit from Earth, watching the planet Venus go in front of our star, which we know intimately. We know the details of Venus's atmosphere extremely well. It's, there's a spacecraft right now in orbit around Venus studying it in great detail. So we know a lot about the atmosphere of Venus. We know a lot about the spectrum of the Sun. And so when we observe that, we can see exactly in precise detail what are the effects of seeing Venus's atmosphere with the sunlight shining through it. And so this will give strong indications to astronomers who are expert in this field, unlike me, uh, to actually draw some inferences in the future about what the details of those atmospheres are around these new planets we're So it's, it's using something local to calibrate something Absolutely. thousands of yeah, light trying years to, away. I mean, if we can't detect something on Venus transiting in front of the sun, yeah. we haven't got a dog show of doing it around a, st a distant star. So basically it's learning what are the things to look for. And of course what you know, people interested in extrasolar planets are interested in is, 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 you know, what is the composition of the atmosphere? First, establishing what atmospheres 
exist there, and we've already detected, directly detected atmospheres around exoplanets. But in particular, what is the composition of those planets? If you can detect oxygen, for example, oxygen absorption lines in the atmosphere of that planet, that would be a strong indication. I mean, uh, probably only life could produce an imbalance of oxygen, a highly reactive chemical element in the atmosphere. So, you know, that's ultimately what they're being used for now on a scientific basis. All the oxygen on Earth was created by life. It was the first pollutant, really, yeah. wasn't it? Well, and it's highly reactive. I mean, if you leave it, if you switch life off, then oxygen would go pretty quickly and be replaced by yeah. carbon dioxide and other things. Um, why doesn't a, a transit like that happen all the time? You've got the sun, you've got Venus and, and us. Um, it yep. should be getting in the way all the time. Yeah, you'd think so. I think I've actually got a convenient little picture. These are just incidentally some pictures of transits that we'll see in the future potentially. Um, if you were living on Uranus in, a, in about 500 years time, maybe humans will have a, a colony out there. Then you'd see Saturn in transit across the sun. And I think this one is a transit of Venus across Jupiter, which will happen in 2065. What about, we've got Youngster. things on Mars. Have they seen a transit of anything in front of the, the sun from Mars? You, you could see a transit of Earth from Mars, in principle. Yep, well, that's, that's a good question. I mean, at the time of Kepler, Kepler died in 1630. Uh, and by 1630, he used his new theory of uh, laws of planetary uh, motion and the observations done by Tycho, uh, Tycho Brahe, the astronomer he inherited all Tycho Brahe's visual observations of the position of Mars. He was able to predict from his tables that there would be a transit in uh, six, uh, 1631, the year after he died, uh, and that he made that prediction. People did actually look for it, but in Europe didn't see it. But we now know that the sun had set at the time that the transit took place in Europe and nobody else appears to have seen it. Um, so, but what he missed and famously was discovered by a guy called um, uh, Jeremiah Horrocks, a young 20-year-old uh, genius, he, he, he became very familiar with uh, Kepler's theories and all the detail and so on. He worked his way through it. He was, you know, heck, he was not long out of school and he got on top of all this. He was easily the most knowledgeable person in Britain and probably the world in this area. And he realized that Kepler had missed the fact that these transits must occur in pairs or should occur in pairs. And so he predicted there should be another one in 1639. And that was only three months after he figured this out. So he suddenly realized, goodness gracious, there's going to be another one in a few months' time. So to cut a long story short, he actually set up to observe it and did observe it. Now the thing is that what they didn't know in 16 30s was the exact, I mean, they knew the sort of size of the orbits and they knew the inclination, but there were lots of things they didn't know. For example, this position here in determining this orbit here of Venus, the red, red orbit, that position there is known as the ascending node, which is where that tilted up orbit crosses the plane of the Earth's orbit. So that's like a hinge point, if you like, and you're tilting the orbit of Venus. If you imagine it tilted, then you can see that knowing that position is kind of important. In the time of Kepler, that was very hairily known. It was not precisely known. Uh, and so predicting whether you'd see a transit or not was very contingent or highly contingent on actually knowing that crossover point. So you can see that basically you only get a, you see a transit if Venus crosses the plane of the Earth's orbit when Earth and Venus are in line. Over here, in this case here, Venus does um, pass, it would pass below the sun, and over here, if you're looking from this side, it would pass well above the sun by several, quite a few degrees. So and it's the, misses by a country mile, basically. So the, it's only a narrow point of view when Venus and Earth are aligned at the time that Venus is crossing its ascending node or its descending node point that you're ever going to see a transit. So there's no such thing as a sep September transit? No. Right, okay. There is a September conjunction of Venus. Oh, okay. uh, in other words, it's in, but broadly in line with the Sun. It's astronomers call it a conjunction. It's in conjunction with the Sun, but it's not possible to transit. 
across the face when it's like that. So that's what basically Kepler only had a vague idea of what this, the angle of that ascending node was, its position was, and he, uh, so he missed the fact that transits occur in pairs. And so I think this diagram here shows it, that he imagined that the transit would sort of bring the planet Venus across the face of the sun like this. In fact, this is what we know happens. It clips this edge here on one point and then eight years later comes around again and bingo clips the other edge. And that's only, a, so in other words, transits occur at the moment eight years apart and that's what Horrocks suddenly realized. Now the orbit of Venus, of course, uh, will slowly change with time uh, as, well, Mercury's famously changes because of effect that predicted by general relativity. Einstein's theory explained the slow rotation of the ellipse of Mercury's orbit slowly rotating around uh, called precession of the orbit and that was ex wasn't explained until 1915 when he published his theory or 1916. But the Venus one, uh, orbit does migrate as well and also all the orbits the planets are affected by things like the effect of Jupiter. So we're not just under the influence of the gravity of the sun which is obviously the dominant force holding everything together but Jupiter is a pretty sizable lump of stuff as well and it also slowly you know, changes the orbits. So the fact that uh, our orbits have numbers uh, doesn't mean they don't change. And so this one here, the fact that we see these orbits coming in these pairs just because of this, in a thousand or a few thousand years that won't be happening. Uh, it won't be clipping the sun on the second of these pairs that'll be missing and so there'll be the orbit, uh, you'll only get one transit per, uh, per century or so. Kepler was unaware of theory of any theory of gravity. He, he just came up with an observational observa uh, you know, observations that says, you know, planets follow these three planetary laws. It wasn't until Newton came up and said, well, what sort of gravitational attraction could there be, or attraction could there be between the sun and the planets that produces Kepler's laws? And there's genius of Newton that he figured out it was just a nice inverse square law that everyone can get to grips with. But this answers the question basically of why transits occur in pairs eight years apart. We're on the second of our eight year pair. The last one was in 2004. Uh, and the other thing that uh, they, you can see from here is that transits occur, can only occur in June and December. So we're currently on June ones. And as you know, that in June in the Southern Hemisphere, it's our winter time, so the sun's low in the sky. So our transits, uh, winter time transits, the June ones, are a little less favorable than the December ones. In 1996 was when they were in line there, but this, what we've come around this wagon wheel again, and we're now at 2004 and 2012. So basically you get these uh, transits, uh, so they both occur in our, in our June winter time period. So the sun's low, so the best place to look at this at the moment is in the northern hemisphere above the equator. Uh, the sun's higher in the sky. In the 19th century, we were had just, the two were, 1874 and 1882, were both in, in December. And if you go back to Cook's time, they were um, back in June. So when you're in Tahiti, of course, June uh, transit was um, high up in the sky and the sun was better observed when you're high in the sky. And the 1882 one was observed yeah, in the southern hemisphere. So they didn't... Uh, it wasn't it right? Yeah, no, in fact, sure, that's a good point. The, yes, the 1882 transit, well, there were two... The 1874 and 1882 transits were big deals in New Zealand. If you look back at this in newspaper accounts of the time, they're full of stories about the transits. The population of the country was really uh, tremendously interested. You had these overseas expeditions coming. You know, we had this inferiority complex back in the 19th century, not just today. Uh, where if overseas people take an interest in us, we think that's absolutely fantastic and we're all over them, it's embarrassing. But anyway, they, they came here with their expeditions and uh, everybody was very interested in what they were doing and they understood what they were doing. You know, the average person today doesn't really understand what the thing is about a transit of Venus. That isn't true in the 19th century. But, so in 1874 there was uh, a lot of expeditions here, but unfortunately it was pretty near cloudy over the whole of the country, I think only Queenstown had a bit of clear sky and a couple of little two-minute glimpses here in Auckland. Um, some amateurs saw it, 
but uh, in 1882, the skies were much more, or the weather was much better, and they got good observations. And the Americans had a big compound here, right on the spot where we're sitting now, Pokakawa. This is the hill that we're sitting on. Um, and uh, so they fenced off this chunk, didn't want the locals coming in, and had all the instruments set up, and they made observations right here. And they were here for some months uh, and attracted a huge amount of public interest. Wow. Um, and uh, one, one uh, Aucklander was involved with them in the, the observations inside their compound at the same, uh, uh, on the spot. Uh, after they left, they left a big, well, people left, a, 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 put a rock here with a plaque on it, uh, and it was here until 1930 when this building was constructed, or the front part of it was constructed. We don't know ever what happened to that marker oh. stone. So, Oh, we hope so. We hope one day somebody will find this big rock that they've overlooked for like a century. Uh, so uh, anyway, so I'm sure the uh, archivists here will know if they've got a big rock with a plaque on it down in the basement somewhere. But it uh, would have taken a bit of effort to get it there, I think. But anyway, so that this place was right here was the site of uh, important observations of the transit of Venus. When's the next one? The next one is 2117. And so these are June, this is a June pair, so it'll be December of 2117. So they come in eight year pairs, but it's not every eight years. It's do -do, yeah. and then you, wait and then you have to wait. Do -do. Yeah, there's actually a gap between each pair, and the, the gap alternates in length of 105 and a half years and 121 and a half years. So basically, they, that's the pattern that, that follows. And so, you know, we can calculate for a long time in advance when these things are going to happen to within seconds. So, no real issue. Well, the event starts, we're assuming the sky is going to be clear, of course, but at the moment the long term forecast isn't that flash. Um, but the uh, event uh, itself, uh, Venus crosses the limb of the sun at around about uh, 16 minutes past 10 in the morning, so, you know, around about that time. It takes about six and a half hours to cross the face of the sun, and when it crosses the uh, moves off the face of the sun, the sun in Auckland's only going to be seven degrees up in the sky. So you have to have a pretty good western horizon to see the tail end of the event. But in principle, you, if you're at a decent viewing position, you'll see the event from start to finish. Um, cliffs at Piha, for example, up on the bluff over Piha with the telescope, you'd get a good view of the entire event. And you know, probably from the summit of a place like One Tree Hill or Mount Eden. Probably, yeah. I mean, uh, seven degrees is pretty low in the sky, but uh, so, but you know, so at least it, it is possible to see the entire event. So the summertime people uh, are going to enjoy this much better. Yeah, the northern in the northern hemisphere. hemisphere yeah, it's basically, I think the sweet spot is somewhere in the South China Sea, probably somewhere uh, around Guam. Somewhere well, well, like it that. doesn't really make difference, does it? I mean, as it long as you can see the sun, it doesn't make it doesn't years. make that big a difference. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, it's visible from Hawaii, and there's a lot of telescopes there, though so they're just on the edge, so the sun is pretty low in the sky for part of that. Um, but uh, Japan and uh, eastern China see the event as well. There's plenty of time to see it at different stages. It's not like um, blink and you'll miss it. I mean, if the sky is clear and there's telescopes available, you've got plenty of time. Uh, well, the path is, in that diagram I showed you is the path relative to the north-south coordinates frame. But of course, the sun is going around the sky and it's rotating because it's north, is rotating as it rises, goes across the sky. So, in fact, if you measure it relative to the horizon, it appears to, which is what a lot of people think of it that way, so if you see the solar orb there, then Venus will appear to come up, turn around and come down the other side, relative to the, the Earth's our plane of the horizon. But relative to the north-south coordinates in the sky, then it uh, follows a straight line. Well, it will curve relative to the horizon. I say there's two different coordinate systems here. So there's actually the... the if, if you just look at the sun relative to the plane of our horizon, then Venus will take a curved trajectory across the face of the sun and come off the edge. But relative to north and south, because the sun, as I say, is it's what north on the sun is changing as it goes across the sky. So if you measure it relative to north and south, which is what, say, a telescope would do, tracking the sun, we would end up with north always in the same point of an eyepiece. Then you'd end up with 
uh, and took a series of measurements, you'd see that the planet appeared to take a straight line across the face of the sun. Yeah, the plan is uh, we've got a new solar telescope at the Stardome, uh, which is very capable, and we've got a very good little uh, specialized video camera for recording the images. So what we're planning to do, if the weather cooperate, is to take um, every few minutes sort of update an image on the website. So the progression of the, of the uh, event will be available live. There are lots of observatories around the world doing this. So if we're clouded out, we'll be getting a feed from someone else uh, so that people who come to start over will be able to see it <coughs> on the screens there, even though it might be cloudy in Auckland. For, for uh, those who can't do either this uh, star dome or the web page, but they've got an opportunity to, and they've got a, a good view. It's how does one view it? Yeah, if you, if you just want to do this from home or something, then uh, you don't want to just stand and look at the sun. Sunglasses aren't any help to you. Uh, the sun's a very dangerous radiation, so you don't you can certainly damage your eyes in fairly short order if you sit and stare at the sun. This unfortunately happens in some countries when they have total eclipses. Mm. Um, the, there are safe solar viewers you can get. Uh, they, Stardome has some little cardboard glasses you can put on that have a uh, particular material that has been tested and known to block the harmful radiation, so you get quite a good view of the sun. You can actually see Venus with your naked eye silhouetted against the sun, so <coughs> provided you've got adequate eye protection. Uh, and the pinhole camera a good idea? Uh, you could, yeah, you could try making a little pinhole camera. Um, if you've got something like um, binoculars, then you, if you're using an optical instrument and you don't have the correct filters, then at least you can project the image of the sun onto a card. So even if you had binoculars or a small telescope, uh, provided you don't try to look through the telescope to do your alignment, the way to do the alignment is to look at the shadow of the telescope against a piece of cardboard so you can push the instrument around until and suddenly you'll see that the light will be coming through the telescope. So you can use the shadow of the telescope on a card to tell you you're pointing at the sun. You think it's common sense but you wouldn't be amazed how many people try to use their finder telescopes and, uh, and so on. So we don't want that to happen. But you can project it onto a card so once you've got the light coming through the instrument onto a card that you're holding there, you can just focus the telescope and you produce a projection of the image onto the card. So you can certainly see the sun perfectly well that way if you've got a small telescope or, let's say, binoculars. The easiest thing with binoculars is to block off, put the cap over one of the lenses and you'll get a, a, some acceptable image of the sun through even 7x50 or 10x50 binoculars. Yeah, I think that Horrocks observed it and uh, his friend William Crabtree, who also observed it, uh, with the you know, they work together, Crabtree and Horrocks. Uh, yeah, projection. They realised that you could shine a light through, uh, the sun's light through the telescope and project it onto a screen in a darkened room. Um, and of course, Horrocks, when he was observing, was it was only just before the sun set, so his telescope was just about horizontal, and so the image would go straight across his room, and he would have got a nice image of the sun that way, or an image, probably as good as instruments would do. Yeah, well, we have to go back to the time of Copernicus, probably, to, you know, sort of around about, you know, late sort of 15th century, when Copernicus first came up with a sort of sun-centred solar system and saw that it, it actually provided a simpler explanation, that uh, the planets actually went around the sun uh, rather than around the Earth. Then the, you know, so Copernican theory was out there for quite a long time, and it was sort of people like Galileo, who in maybe 1580 started taking an interest in that sort of stuff. Uh, of course, it wasn't until his uh, telescope, uh, he developed his uh, first telescope in about 1609 that he was able to then do things like look at Jupiter and see that there were other things going around Jupiter. So everything didn't go around the Earth at all. He's Jupiter with a family of moons going around it. So, you know, it, it, and other observations that he made and uh, found that everything seemed to fit the Copernican view much better than the terrestrial centred view. It was, and sort of Kepler and, and Galileo exchanged letters. Um, I think Galileo found Kepler a bit too mystical for his tastes. He was uh, used to cast astrological predictions as well, as uh, was almost requirement actually, to if you had a position with this uh, astronomer for some emperor that you 
you know, dabbled in that sort of nonsense. But, you know, obviously Galileo had a little time for that sort of stuff. But they certainly exchanged letters, were well aware of each other. And at his time, of course, in his time, Galileo was probably the most famous man in Europe. Um, very, very prominent and, you know, served him, well, nasty things could have happened to him if he wasn't quite so prominent. And I understand he had his first astronomical telescope was the only one that ever had, the only one that was absent of the proviso written on the side, do not under any circumstances look directly at the sun. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. gave it a go, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He, uh, <laughs> the whole story, he made many, many telescopes, Galileo, and uh, it was a hit and miss business in those days. The theory of optics wasn't well understood. Kepler, I might add, did you know, produce a theory of optics uh, as well that uh, led to the Keplerian telescope, which was actually better than Galileo's one so eventually. But um, so what, Galileo died 1642, same year Newton was born. So, and by then Kepler was dead. And of course, the Newton was only in his 20s when he figured out the inverse square law, but never published it. And it was Halley that sort of you know prevailed on him to publish it. In fact, uh, I think they went to he went and saw Galileo and said you know well um, went and saw Newton and said well exactly you know what sort of law what sort of force law would be required holding the planets in the solar system uh, to explain Kepler's laws. And he says oh, I worked that out years ago. It's an inverse square law, but he hadn't bothered to tell anybody. And so it was really sort of the intervention of of Halley that uh, got that work published. When Cook observed it, what did he think it was? What was known about Venus? A dot in the sky, a thing? Yeah, it, well, obviously known to be a planet. Um, exactly how big it was and how far away it was was roughly known uh, at the time of um, Cook. The, um, it definitely wasn't at the time of Horrocks. I mean, the one of the, uh, just back up a second, that when Horrocks first saw Venus in front of the Sun, it was a completely different size to what they were expecting. Astronomers at the time, with very poor telescopes, had no idea, no way of really measuring the size of Venus in the sky, so they imagined it was bigger until it was projected against the Sun. They didn't realize really how small it was. So that was a big thing that he found right then and there, just from that. Um, you've, you've got a picture of Horrocks doing this, haven't you? I do have a picture somewhere. Full of historical faults. Those yeah, so there's a painting. Uh, of course, we don't know what Horrocks looked like, um, know a lot, a little about his uh, actual life, but here he is with his telescope um, projecting the sun's image onto a screen, and that's the house he supposedly did the observations from. Uh, some of the details of his, how he became so well educated and formed is, is not really fully understood. He attended Cambridge for a while. Um, that he was probably a teacher at a local school. I think that they knew, um, because they could measure, once they saw the, once you see the moons going around Jupiter, that provides you with using Kepler's law a way of measuring the mass of Jupiter. So they knew Jupiter was large, they could measure its size, its density, they knew that it couldn't be solid rock like the Earth, basically. So, yeah, it was known quite early on that, uh, you know, at the time of Newton, that the Saturn and Jupiter were in a different class to the terrestrial planets. And these are just some example pictures, but this is actually what Horrocks would have seen when the sun was close to setting. He just saw Venus coming onto the edge of the sun. Now, these aren't his pictures, these are computed. Uh, so, <laughs> and he, he, he got about that far onto the sun and then the sun set. Yeah. And this is a f really fanciful picture of his friend William Crabtree. They never actually physically met, but they exchanged a lot of letters. Uh, but, of course, Crabtree at the time was 27 years old, so you can see the artist has made some sort of pretty wild extrapolations as to what they thought Crabtree might look like. And no, of that's course what 27-year-olds look like in those days. <laughs> well, hey. here, you know, you have you know, the mum sort of keeping the bends away from the crazy old husband here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, anyway, that's a nutty one. But these are actually, these are actually uh, reproductions of, uh, copies of um, Horrocks' observations. So he drew the position of the sun. So he caught it just there, and he managed to get three fixes on it. But that was enough to fix the position of Venus's orbit in space. Uh, so he, he was able to make a whole lot of improvements. For example, uh, so I think at the time Horrocks did this, they thought, a lot of people thought that the sun was about 20 million kilometers away. 
uh, Horrocks observations pushed out to about 90 million kilometers, and now the modern value is 150. Uh, so, you know, it was a huge improvement at that time. Kepler was no mug. I mean, how did he get that wrong? So wrong. Well, there wasn't, uh, well, it just the observations weren't precise enough to, you know, to, to nail down the orbital position. Uh, bear, bear in mind, at Kepler's time, telescopes are only just becoming a practical proposition, and that was near the end of his life. Oh. So for most of the time, he was using observations that had been done visually, just by eye, using a sighting scope, essentially not an optical scope, done by Tycho Brahe, the Danish astronomer. So he, he had accumulated enormous numbers of visual observations of the position of Mars. And so when he died, Kepler inherited all that, and in a well, what you could only describe as a, uh, a superhuman effort on Kepler's part of, of just doing all the enormous amounts of sums by hand and uh, crunching those numbers year in, year out to actually produce, deduce these laws is just astounding. And that's really what astronomers were looking for, what's called the third contact. Because Halley imagined that if you had the, this dark blob silhouette against the bright background, you'd be able to tell that measure that point to within a second. Unfortunately, it's not what actually happened. So when Cook went to Tahiti, expecting that to be the case, setting up his things, this is actually the, some of the, what he actually saw. He saw the Venus appearing to stick to the edge of the sun and producing this really blobby view. So his times, he couldn't decide the time of third contact to a second as Halley had thought. And these are some of more of his observations. So that's the effect, and uh, how did he feel about that? He was pretty ticked off. <laughs> he was uh, say, you know, it was the reason for going there, mounting this expedition, sailing around to the other side of the world to uh, the island of Tahiti, which had only been discovered a few years prior. Um, it had been visited by the HMS Dolphin a couple of years prior to Cook visiting, but that had been the only British vessel to have visited the islands. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of interesting stories about Cook. I mean, he was a great planner, and he knew that HMS Dolphin, when it was there, the crew discovered that the local women would do anything, virtually anything, for a nail, because you know they had never encountered metal. Um, and once the crew figured that out, they started pulling nails out of the ship, <laughs> a lot of nails, and it almost caused the ship to fall apart. So. Cook learned from that, so on his expedition he had several bar bar barrels of nails in the hold uh, <laughs> to, uh, to protect the endeavour against the, that, that bizarre, potential disaster. In the 1761 transits, uh, you know, the European powers sent off expeditions to the corners of the known Earth at that time. There were a lot of unexplored parts of the Earth in 1761. Very dangerous to get to. People lost their lives going on these expeditions. A number of these astronomers uh, didn't come back. But uh, unfortunately, there's a seven year war was raging between France and Britain at the time. So, French expeditions that's headed out to certain places arrived there to find that they'd changed hands and they had to get out of it. Um, so, there's all sorts of fascinating stories that sort of um, they're actually encountered. There's a book just been published on the transit of Venus and it talks about some of these. Uh, fascinating um, histories of these expeditions. In the future, a thousand years from now or more, it won't be just, they won't be coming in pairs, that the orbits will have shifted slightly and we'll end up with Venus just going much more through dead centre, but only one at a time, not in pairs. So. Mm. We'll eventually reach an interesting point where they'll appear to graze, maybe in, I can't, haven't worked out when, but uh, you know, hundreds of years into the future, uh, one of these events will just be Venus grazing the edge of the sun, which would be an interesting event to watch uh, our descendants, assuming there are any. Um. Before the understanding of uh, Einstein's relativity, wasn't there, because Mercury wasn't orbiting to a totally Newtonian scheme, mm -hmm. there was an idea that there had to be another planet? They even go Indeed. to Maine? Indeed, Vulcan. That was, uh, in fact, even at the time of well into the 19th century, uh, in the end of the 19th century, they were still uh, putting out alerts to keep an eye open for Vulcan. Um, and uh, it was looked for during total eclipses. So in other words, what Graham's saying quite correctly is that uh, it, there was a theory that uh, 
you could explain the odd movement of Mercury by postulating that some other planet is going around inside the orbit of Mercury that's affecting its position slightly. And people tried mathematically all these different ways of uh, trying to explain it that way. Um, I don't think any of the mathematics would have really come out very helpfully, except that you know people did look for the possibility that was some other planet orbiting close in, looking uh, for potential transits of that planet as across the face of the sun, because of course if it was much closer to Mercury, then the chance of it transiting would be quite high, and you should see it fairly regularly, but nobody ever really did. They looked for it during total eclipses where you might see it shining close to the sun. Um, it, it proved not to be the case. And so basically, general, it wasn't though until general relativity theory explained the mo motion of Mercury quite precisely that, that the whole idea that there was another planet there got, had to get you know, moved off the agenda. Spotless homeless. Yeah, these are sort of just showing some pictures here of the sort of instruments that were in use here in 1874. So this is from the English expedition. They, they brought serious gear with them. Um, and uh, these are some of the instruments they used for setting time, what's called transit telescopes, because uh, you could work out your local time on the surface of the Earth just by observing when the sun crossed the north-south line. So you can measure that quite precisely. So if you're an explorer somewhere on the planet, in the 19th century or 18th century, you could work out your local time relative to the, where the sun is crossing the north-south line. The problem that you didn't, couldn't solve in the 18th century was the fact that you, in order to work out your longitude, you'd, it, the difference between solar time in London at Greenwich compared with solar time where you are on the planet. So you can work out what your time is somewhere on the planet, like in New Zealand, in uh, Cook's time, but you need to know the time in Greenwich at the same time. And uh, so that uh, you know, was a difficult problem to solve, the problem of longitude. Uh, it wasn't solved until Harrison developed his clocks, famous clocks that uh, we use. But the, I'd just like to mention this guy, Henry Seven, because he's a fascinating case of a guy who in, um, he was a chemist, a trained chemist, scientific chemist, working in gold assaying in Thames. Grahamstown, actually, just part of what's modern Thames. And uh, he knew this transit was coming up and knew the importance of it in 1874. So he set about some years prior to that building a telescope to use to observe the transit. And he, he created this large telescope by grinding a mirror, uh, a parabolic mirror, uh, and uh, getting it the right shape, which is a not trivial exercise, and then coating it with metallic silver to make it reflective. And he was able to uh, end up uh, with this telescope after this long effort to build it. I might say that the idea of being able to grind a mirror like that out of glass and it had only been, the, the, the method of testing was only worked out by Leon Foucault, the French scientist, in about uh, 18, uh, late 1850s. So it, it was new information at that time. So, so he start here at the. Pardon? He was giving this a lash over here. And he, yes, and he was doing this in Thames. And uh, he uh, set this up, and he also needed to know the time. And he knew that uh, the British had an electric clock down at Burnham, uh, where the military camp is today. That's where they set up their compound. And using telegraph, you could, wires up the country, you could hook into those and get your clock local clock regulated by the one in Burnham. So everyone, that sounded a great idea. Unfortunately, there was no telephone wire to Thames at that time. There was a, up the main trunk, basically. You could get it in Auckland, but not in Thames. So he badgered the bureaucrats in Wellington to accelerate the laying of this telegraph wire through to Thames, which they managed to accomplish. So here he was all set to go. And of course, after that effort of years, it was cloudy in Thames that day. So poor Henry Seven, he, was, uh, he gave a number of lectures in Auckland about his, uh, how to make telescopes and so on. And he uh, uh, then left uh, New Zealand, I think, around about um, just before uh, 1880 and returned to Britain. But uh, anyway, he was quite, a, quite an interesting character. He found his machine useful despite missing the... I don't know trends. what he used. I've no information about what else he used the telescope Good. for or what happened to the telescope. Yeah. Um, but uh, he was just one of a number of people. But um, at that time, that was easily the biggest telescope in New Zealand. 11-inch um, aperture, so that's pretty big 
piece of glass uh, for right. a reflecting telescope. So poor old Henry Seddon. Mm. The other people that observed in Auckland in 1874 was um, a guy called Samuel John Lambert, who was a very interesting eccentric character, uh, very active in amateur astronomy, and wrote lots of letters to the press about astronomy. Uh, he uh, was quite a, uh, he set up and he observed it with some other people at the house of Mrs. Coombs in, in Hobson Street, um, somewhere when near the Sky Tower. We don't, haven't actually yet worked out precisely the geographic spot that he was sitting on, but where that house used to be. Not there now, of course. Um, but uh, anyway, so Lambert was there with some others and they got a brief glimpse of the 1874 transit through some cloud. And Redfern is, uh, we now know there were a bunch of Redfern brothers that are involved in photography. That was George Redfern we just recently found. And there are, I think, um, stuff about Redfern and uh, his collection and so on. And in fact, Mrs. Coombs' diary is in the museum, uh, in the uh, library here at the museum. But elsewhere in Australia, the, the transits were observed very well. And uh, that's the, you can see that in 1882, this is a map was done by Proctor in 1875.